Okay, um, Alice Weingartner is the Chief Strategy Officer with the Community Care Network of Kansas. Uh, community care is comprised of community care clinics with a common goal of providing high quality health care that is accessible to all Kansans and supports the network of clinics through advocacy, education, and communication. Prior to joining community care in 2020, Alice Weingartner was the director of community development for Grace Meds Topeka Clinics. Grace Med is a federally qualified health center with 16 locations in South Central and Northeast Kansas. Prior to joining Grace Med in 2016, Alice was the Shawnee County Health Agency, was with the Shawnee County Health Agency and held positions in several areas, including community relations and public information, emergency preparedness and operations, and as the Community Health Center Director. In July 2016, Grace Med assumed the operations of Shawnee County's Community Health Center, and Alice became the Regional Operations Director and assisted with bringing the clinics online. Following the com completion of a feasibility study to determine support for a local capital campaign to develop a new hub clinic, she moved into the Director of Community Development role. While fundraising and develop development is a primary focus of her work, she has also relied on her knowledge of the community to identify opportunities for collaboration. Topeka became home to Alice, her husband and their two children in 2001. She is a 2017 Leadership Greater Topeka graduate, a member of Southwest Topeka and serves on the board of directors. Alice graduated from the University of Charleston, West Virginia with a BA in Mass Communications and a Master of Education from Wichita State University. In her free time, she enjoys spending time with her husband and blowing bubbles with her golden doodle Ivy June uh, in an attempt to keep her from eating the plants in the garden. Alice also enjoys hiking and kayaking with a local organization that promotes women being outside enjoying nature. Welcome, Alice Weingartner. Thank you, Vicki. I see people clapping, so... I think over time we've learned to just pause for a moment when this virtual environment. So we'll go ahead and move forward. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to, to get to visit with you all and talk a little bit about the organization that I've recently joined, but I've been able to work with for um, a number of years. So um, the Community Care Network of Kansas um, really is an organization that's here to support clinics across the country. Um, it primarily started with the supporting federally qualified health centers, which began more than 50 years ago as part of the social justice and health equity movement. And the mission was to improve the lives of Americans living in deep poverty who are in desperate need of health care. And um, they began in 1965, and there's now more than 1,400 health centers across the United States. Um, we at the Community Care Network of Kansas, which was formerly known as KMU. Some of you may recall it as that. Um, and I apologize if you hear my dog barking. That is Ivy June and someone knocked on the door, of course. So our mission is really to provide that whole person care. Um, we want to achieve equitable, high quality care so that anybody has access to it across the state and that the um, payment isn't a barrier for folks to get care. That's really important to us as well. Um, our organization came um, into being in 1989. Um, we did go through a name change just last year, um, but really our focus continues to be on providing that excellent quality care through our clinics. Um, this is a map of where we have clinics across the state who are members of our organization. Um, we have 34 community-based clinics with more than 100 sites across the state of Kansas. Um, these clinics in 2019 provided over $44 million worth of uncompensated care in the state. 
Um, in addition to that, they serve approximately 317,000 Kansas, Kansans, meaning more than one in nine individuals in our state receive their care at a community health center in or near their community. Of these clinics, some of them provide a wide variety of services. They may provide medical, dental, behavioral health, vision. Um, some may be only standalone dental clinics, but they do all um, work pretty well together in order to ensure that that whole person care is accessible across the state. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting is last year was the first year that as a network of clinics, they saw over a million patient visits. And that was the first time that um, as a network of clinics, they had broken that million dollar mark. And that was in serving 320,000 um, Kansans statewide. As an organization, um, you know, we talk a lot about our values. Um, and they're all listed here, um, integrity, results, having our employees be engaged, being innovative, and um, really focusing on service is really important to us. Um, just a little bit of background for me, while I worked you know, at the local level in a health center for a number of years, um, I joined the Community Care Network in January, and it really wasn't until, um, well, it was, March 16th, I think all of us probably have a date in March that's burned in our, to our brain when life changed for us. And so, you know, as a result of coming into a new job, into a new role, and thinking I was going down one path, and now everything changed as a result of COVID-19, we as an organization had to be really innovative and figure out how do we work from home? How do we use technology? So we were doing the same things that most businesses were doing and that our health centers were also doing at that same time. So it's really been a transition on so many levels um, for the clinics across the state. I thought I would share um, a video that talks a little bit about um, the clinics and who we are and it just gives you a good picture of um, you know what we're doing to provide care of the patients that we serve, 90% of our patients have incomes at or below 200% of the federal poverty level. More than 33% of them are uninsured and about 30% of them are covered by Medicaid. So um, our population is very diverse and the clinics are really there to try to make sure that they're meeting the needs of their community. So I'm gonna play this short video for you. What if we all subscribe to the radical notion that the most fundamental element in healthcare is care? That we are all worth it and the definition of true care should encompass all that we are. Community Care Network of Kansas is leading the state to rethink what healthcare means. Community care clinics are champions of whole person comprehensive care. Together, we are advocates, educators, providers, patients, innovators aligned in the belief that we must not separate the minds, bodies, and smiles of our communities. Not community in the sense of individuals associated only by proximity. Real community, together, connected by a commonality and understanding that we are all better and we are all well. Healthy people make healthy communities. When we invest in our fellow citizens, we strengthen our state. One in 10 Kansans relies on a clinic and community care network for their well-being. The nearly 300,000 served are not nameless faces. They are our brothers and sisters, friends and neighbors. They are a person, not a prognosis. They are Kansans. Those served are not a charter. They are charter members of the transformation of healthcare. So that just gives you a little bit of a picture of the type of work that we do. Um, you know, much like I know Linda will talk about, since March, our clinics radically shifted the work that they are doing and really have been focusing so much 
um, if not 100% of their attention on addressing the COVID pandemic in their communities. Um, the clinics themselves immediately saw a 90% decrease in patient visits um, you know, as the uh, pandemic was unfolding and as the um, rules of where and when you could be someplace were changing. Um, so that resulted in the clinics moving to the use of telehealth. Um, this was something we had been working on for years with the clinics, helping them try to transition to that. And they'd done a really good job in the behavioral health world. Um, but as soon as COVID hit, you know, within days, if not weeks, the clinics were doing telemedicine virtually, some even going so far as to provide some teledentistry services. So many dentist offices had to close down. Um, as of today, 59% of our clinics are providing some form of telemedicine. All of our federally qualified health centers are offering it. 90% um, of our federally qualified health centers are doing behavioral health via telemedicine. 54% um, of our state grantees, those are clinics that get funding through a state grant, are offering um, behavioral health. So they've really done a good, good job, a really good job of transitioning um, to change to meet the needs in the community, in addition to offering testing, um, doing respiratory clinics to try to help those folks who have been ill. One of the roles we've taken on as an organization in trying to help them along the way is we've really tried to become that um, central point in ordering um, personal protection equipment. And so you can see up in the left hand corner of the screen, um, our team receiving a load of PPE. Um, we've been distributing it out across the state. Um, I think we've, we've distributed over 100,000 pieces of PPE so far. Um, we'd like to do a few more pieces, but sometimes it's hard to get. So we continue to work um, in that regard as well because they need PPE just like the hospitals do and just like other clinics do and the health department and schools will now be needing. So there's a lot of um, collaboration and communication going on to try to address those needs. Um, I thought I would end with just another short video that talks about how the clinics are responding to COVID. Um, it continues to be a challenge um, for so many organizations and entities, but um, we'll just continue to move forward and work through those challenges. Um, once this video is done, I can pause for questions, or if you want to wait for questions after Linda, um, we can go either way. So I'll play this video for you. We are here to assure that all Kansans have equitable access to high quality whole person care, regardless of who they are, where they live, how much money they make, or if they have health insurance. We firmly believe that where you live should not determine what you live. Our community that we serve, we gotta know that no matter the changes, we're always gonna be here to continue to provide high quality health care. During the pandemic, or when that started, they instantaneously had to transform the way they provided care. Immediately, senior leaders came together and put at the forefront of all we do, taking care of our patients, but also to keep our staff safe. If, if we don't protect our staff, then we could not provide the services to our community. The pace of which we had to move was exceedingly fast. We were on call 24 seven, whether it was responding to the needs of the clinic, to dealing with what we need to do to assist patients. We really emphasize the need at this time for people not to forego care, but to make sure they're managing chronic disease and wellness visits. We also have divided the clinic day, so we have sick times and well times. We've gone out to curbside and provided care. A lot of our behavioral health patients, we begin reaching out to them immediately to make certain that if they were struggling because of the fear associated with COVID-19, that they felt supported. We've worked very hard to demonstrate that we are a clinic for everybody when they need us. What we have seen in our communities is that people started to see us as taking the lead in this response to COVID. It's our mission to really promote a healthy community, and this is the community we serve. So we are going to do our very best to make certain that they have the access to the resources and the information and the education that they need to keep themselves safe. These clinics were there before the pandemic. They are there now and still helping with the pandemic. They are part of the solution and they 
will be there in the future. They believe, in fact, that we are all worth it. So Vicki, one last thing I do want to say, just to kind of tie into um, Linda is, you know, while the community health, the community care network of Kansas, we're focused on, you know, the clinic based care that's happening in our community. Um, our clinics do try to work very closely within their own local communities with their local health departments. So there is collaboration between those partners, you know, again, to address such things as the COVID pandemic that we're experiencing, but also making sure that if they know of folks within, particularly in the health department world who need health care, they can refer them to the community health centers in those communities. So we really do try to work closely with those community partners and encourage our clinics to do the same. So I don't know if you want to do questions or wait. Um, I guess I'm kind of thinking in the interest of um, hearing from any, everyone, it might be best to uh, go ahead and see if we can um, move to Linda since, um, and if you, if you have a question, if you can put it in the chat box, um, uh, that might be helpful too. Um, and we can see that. Um, so I think Alice, if you want to stop sharing your screen, I can set, um, Linda up here. There we go. There we go. Mickey, can you see the slide? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, I can. So um, let me um, do a couple of other magic things here. Um, so I want to introduce Linda Oates. Um, Linda graduated from Kansas State University in 1979 with a Bachelor of Science degree in Social Work and a Bachelor of Science in Family Life and Human Development. She received her Master of Social Work from Washburn University in 2001. Linda has been a social worker for 30, 33 years and has worked primarily in public health for 21 years, including programs such as maternal and infant care and home health. She was a member of the Topeka Adult Abuse Coalition for four years and was the first chairperson of the Topeka Shawnee County Hoarding Task Force. She is a founding member of the Shawnee County Suicide Prevention Coalition and a co-author of the Shawnee County Suicide Cluster Response Plan. Linda served as the Family Service Division Manager for the Shawnee County Health Agency from 2005 to 2017. Through that time, she supervised WIC, immunizations, medical records, maternal and child health, home health, communicable diseases, STD clinic, and the TB control program. Linda was appointed as the interim director of the Shawnee County Health Department in May 2017 and appointed permanent director October the 5th, 5th 2017. In her time off work, she enjoys bike riding and playing with her five grandchildren, ranging in age from two to five years. And there is a set of twins in that. So, uh, and we welcome Linda Oaks. Thanks for being here, Linda. Thank you, Vicki. It's a pleasure to be here and to be presenting with Alice. Alice and I worked together for many years, and so it's always enjoyable to get to do things with her again. So um, I thought I was busy when I was the division manager over all those programs. Um, I didn't know what busy was, but I do now. So. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about community health in the age of COVID-19 and a pandemic and how that's impacted the health department and the community and what we what I see happening in the future 
um, as we move forward and try to kind of get back to, I know the new normal that's overused a lot, but it is a new normal. We all have to um, behave differently and work differently as Alice was talking about. This has affected every single person. And I know it's hard for every single person in many ways. I get that too. Um, so we're all just dealing with it the best we can. So um, how did we get here? I think that's always a good question. This is a chart that Dr. Norman actually shared. He is the state health officer and secretary of the Kansas Department of Health and Environment. And I really like the timeline because it does show kind of what happened back in March when we closed the schools and then the stay at home orders and then what happened when the state order became guidance and then you can see the upward trend that's only through july 11th um, i do hope kansas is kind of leveling off i don't know that i do hope shawnee county is leveling off i can't say that yet i think thing, i'm hoping things are improving with some of the orders that we have put in place so that's how we got here today and so what are we doing now at the health department? So when this, um, when this pandemic hit Shawnee County, we immediately had to move most of our staff into the COVID response. Um, I've said many times in presentations that um, we did a lot of years of doing more with less. And so now this is where we are. <laughs> we, we have less staff than we did years ago. If you remember back to the H1N1 response and we did all those shots at the Expo Center, we probably had twice the staff, nursing staff, in the local health department side than we do now. So um, when we do get the vaccine for COVID-19, those clinics are going to look pretty different um, just because it's going to be a lot less of our staff and a lot more partners and temp staff and other people. So right now we're doing of course, we're doing testing along with the hospitals. Um, we're doing contact tracing and we're doing a lot of contact tracing. So every case of COVID-19 has to be investigated by um, our nurses or we do have a company that we've contracted with to do some of that work. So we're trying to shift that to the company and away from our staff so they can get back to doing um, newborn virtual home visits, virtual home visits with um, at-risk parents, um, we're still doing WIC, but we're doing it remotely. So the Women, Infant, Children program. Um, luckily, we have those uh, electronic benefit cards, so it makes it a lot easier. Um, so trying to get our immunization clinic just started up again last week. We started taking appointments and we're only vaccinating children who are in the Vaccine for Children program. So children with Medicaid, uninsured or underinsured. So we really had to prioritize which kids we would see before school started. We're doing a lot of media campaigns and you're gonna see a lot more um, with the Mask Up Topeka and Mask Up Shawnee County. Um, we have a group that's working on those campaigns. You're gonna be seeing billboards. You're gonna see more on social media. You're going to see um, bus wrap. We're doing everything we can think of to get the word out, to have everyone hopefully wearing masks when they are out in public and out around other people. Part of the response for coronavirus and COVID-19 is we're working very closely with emergency management. We have an incident action plan and an incident command system that has been set up. Dusty Nichols is the incident commander. I started out as the incident commander and um, honestly, it was too much um, in order to run a health department and try to run the whole response. And so we divided up those duties and it's worked really well. I think he's done an excellent job as our incident commander. and so. Um, that collaboration, we have worked closely with emergency management for years and that's paying off now, I think, in our response here in Shawnee County. So we are slowly getting staff back to their old jobs. We're hiring new staff. You're probably hearing some of that in the media and from the news uh, and from the meetings, the commission meetings. Um, we are expanding a little bit, not a ton, but a little bit so that we can continue to respond to this. Um, I think we're looking at a year or two honestly, of working with COVID-19. So we had to do what we need to do to get our staff back to what they normally do. So that's what we're doing now. And what we wish we were doing is back to the work we were doing up until January, which is focusing on our services that we do, individual services and the community health piece. We know that we need to work on our health as a community, that there's a lot of work to do. And we had started putting a lot of pieces in place 
to focus on the health of the community. So um, I'm reminded by several of my colleagues that I used to just wish with the health department and public health and the health of the community would get more attention. And now I'm thinking that's enough attention. <laughs> Let's have less attention on COVID and more on this. And so um, you can see I have the, um, the community health improvement plan, which I'm gonna briefly touch on here in a minute. I have the county health rankings. And I know Alice is sitting there laughing because I don't like the county health rankings. Honestly, they are difficult. Um, they are a lot of times old data and um, does it really matter how we rank against other counties? But apparently it does. There's always a lot of attention and press around that. And so um, I am almost kind of missing those at this point, if you can believe it. And um, I do have the version, the 2020 County Health Rankings. Um, they were not really published widely because of COVID-19, but we did see a drop in some of our um, rankings. And so it was not gonna be good news this year anyway. And so we know we have a lot of work to do. And I can also tell you that not only is it not good news for the county, but we continue to see so many health disparities, especially amongst our Hispanic population, our African-American population. We've got a lot of work to do in that area. And if you've been following some of the news about COVID-19, you know those populations are also much more, they're getting a much bigger hit as far as COVID-19. We're seeing more cases and more deaths in those groups. So we know we have a lot of work to do, and I know that's where the community health centers a lot of times come into um, the picture and help out with providing care, that that's a, that's a very important part of that. So these are the areas that we were, we are getting ready to get back into with our expanded staff. We're going to have the people to get back into this work. So um, just to give you a little bit of an idea about some of the health disparities that we're seeing, and I got to move this little on my screen. Okay, so our health outcomes rank went from 79th to 81st. Our length of life went from 78th to 81st. So we're losing ground in our length of life. And um, for low birth weight, there's a 7% rate for whites and 12% for blacks. Infant mortality, 6% for whites, 11% for blacks. That's almost double for black babies. Premature death, and the, that is the years of potential life lost the rate is double for blacks when compared to whites. So we know we've got a lot of work to do in these areas and um, that's what we're gonna need to be doing over the next few years as well as responding to COVID. This is the health department strategic plan that we wrote last year. Um, I'm very proud of it. We haven't been able to touch it this year, but we will keep it and use it next year, hopefully, um, and the end of this year. And you can see health equity, organizational excellence and community engagement are our pillars. Those are the areas that we feel as a health department, we need to be focusing on to help the community um, become more healthy. And so you know that public health, I know you all know this now, is not just about the health department, it's about everyone. Everyone's in public health. And so um, we need that community engagement, we need all those partners to help focus on that and focus on the health of the community. So we wanna get back to that work that we were doing. Some of the projects that we had going, we did hire um, a staff person for Vallejo. We gave them the money to, to hire a community health specialist. And we have a community health specialist at the health department. So those people are gonna to work together. We know that mental health came out as one of the big needs in our community health improvement plan, our community health needs assessment. So that area is an area that we're going to be focusing on. That person has been hired. They are working at Vallejo. We just haven't had a chance to work with them much yet, but we will be in the future. So I'm very excited about that partnership. I think it's great that when we can put staff and other agencies, that just spreads the work of community health um, around the community. Shawnee County Parks and Rec. We love partnering with Parks and Rec. If there's ever another department that focuses on health, Parks and Rec is, is one of them. And so we are hoping, the director of Parks and Rec and I are hoping to share a grant writer. We have passed on a lot of money that we could have brought into the community. Both of our departments have passed on that money because we didn't have anyone that could write the grants, report on the grants. And um, 
right now there's a lot of COVID money coming in and my accountants are drowning in it, but they're doing okay. But there's just a lot of pieces to that. So we do need that help with that grant writer to get that money into our community and to work on projects together. Um, more signage, more trails, more opportunities for people to get out and exercise all people. Maybe um, more improved. They've done a lot of work on playgrounds. I'd like to see that continue in a lot of our neighborhoods. Um, the family park is being discussed right now. I think that's a great opportunity to get your voice and your opinion heard about that. So there's some um, great work ahead of us in Parks and Rec. And then the other chart I have here was our survey we did on family planning. We have not done family planning at the health department for many years. We want to bring it back to serve those people who can't get the services they want anywhere else. We want to fill a gap. And um, honestly, we were ready to go and COVID hit. And so we lost our provider. Um, so we're kind of back at square one, but the hope is still to provide family planning services for those people who need that in our community. So those, those are just some of the projects that I really hope we can get back to soon that were rolling and then got sidetracked. The Community Health Improvement Plan was finished last year and um, Heartland Healthy Neighborhoods takes the lead on this. The health department employs a community health planner and she is the one who works with Heartland Healthy Neighborhoods to work on the Community Health Improvement Plan. Her salary is half funded by a grant from the Topeka Community Foundation. So again, another great partnership. She is helping us look at ways we can um, try projects, we can measure our success. We've had good plans before, and I talk with my hands as you can tell, but we, all, we haven't always um, done a great job of marking our progress, of showing the data, of, of showing how we're doing on these. So that is an area that we really are looking at improving as far as dashboards and that kind of you know reporting out. So she's gonna be working on that. She has been working on COVID because we lost our epidemiologist but I'm happy to say we've hired a new one. And so Susan will be going back to her work as the community health planner with Heartland Healthy Neighborhoods. That is what she's hired to do. So I, I see that as a really great, again, another great partnership to help Heartland Healthy Neighborhoods with that paid staff move on to the work they need to do. And these are the priority areas from the community health improvement plan. So those were the four areas identified in the needs assessment that we need to be working on. So if you wanna see our community health improvement plan, it's on our website. Um, it's under the About Us tab. And um, I think if, if you're interested in that, we have a lot of outcomes and how we're gonna measure those things. So these are the main areas that that community health improvement plan will be working on um, in the coming couple of years, so. And then my last slide just talks about the philosophy that we've been following, and I know many of you have seen this diagram before with the stream, you know, we want to try to work as much in the community impact area of the stream as we can. And that is strategies that include laws, policies, and regulations that help support health for all people. And we've done that work in the past. Tobacco 21, I think, is one of the best examples and recent examples that um, the health department helped to get passed in our community and luckily it held up in court. Um, the mask ordinance is another uh, example of a policy or law right in, in effect right now. So, um, and, and as you know, those sometimes are tough sells. We have to do a lot of work with our elected officials, but we are doing that work. And so uh, we wanna continue that because we know that the largest impacts are made at the policy level. and um, as, as the picture says, policy is the vaccine for the social determinants of health. That's where we can make the biggest impact. We're doing a lot of midstream work, of course, too, and the downstream work, which is the cl clinical care. All those pieces need to be um, in place in order for the community to see better community health. So I think that's just a quick overview of what we're doing here and um, what we're hoping to be doing in the future. And I'd be, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now and I can answer questions with Alice. Excellent. Um, so let me ask everybody, if you have any questions, I'll let you unmute yourself and um, uh, wave your hand and <laughs> I think we can see you here. Uh, 
I have a question. Uh, Linda, what kind of uh, um, community support from what like, our organization could be helpful in your efforts? We often advocate for community programs and be helpful to get your perspective. Um, thank you. That's that's a great question. I think um, contacting your elected officials and letting them know how you feel. Um, we, we know and you know this is true. Our elected officials hear from the people who are unhappy, right? That's the people who email and call. So if you like something that's happening, if you um, if you um, think you, we should have a mask ordinance and it should stay in place, anything like that, or if you don't, whatever your opinion is, if you can share that with your elected officials and keep in touch with them, they do listen. They do read those emails. They may not answer all of them, but they do listen. Um, and just, you know, supporting that, that we're all in this together. The commissioners are, I think they have the, the toughest job in town right now, trying to keep everybody happy. <laughs> That's pretty hard to do. So, um, and they're doing a great job at what they're doing and they're, they're listening to the public and they're listening to us. And so um, I think that's, that's the best thing you can do to support that. And then also I would say, you know, as we're taking a lot of grant money, we are expanding staff. And I, I hope people see that as not just taking advantage of a situation here to build up the health department, because that is not what we're doing. I'm trying to keep my staff from going crazy and working seven days a week. Um, we need to, we needed to, boost up our staff numbers a little bit. And so I think that will be a benefit to the entire community. I know it will be when we have people that can do the contact tracing faster, that can look at the cases and see where we're having outbreaks. Um, so that staff is important. And I think sometimes that gets missed. Yeah. Um, so we have a question in the chat box. Um, so can you share some sample COVID examples for the various sections of the upstream health diagram? Sure. And do you want me to share that diagram again? Um, Would that be helpful? I can pretty I'm, quickly. I'm looking at the person here. Lisa? <laughs> yeah. Do you see it now? Yeah. Okay. Sometimes I share my email. I don't mean to, but sometimes I do. <laughs> so um, I think the downstream, of course, is the clinical care. And that's what our community health centers are doing, our hospitals, um, medical interventions. It's people being hospitalized, people getting tested, the care on the individual level. And we have, we've always had good health care here. Um, I, I think we've been lucky with that. And so I we meet regularly with the hospitals. We're working with uh, Grace Med, as Alice said. So we, we stay in communication with them. So I think that area is going really well. As far as the midstream, which is the social services and food access, we're doing it. It's rough. I'll be honest with you. Um, we, we're going to have an opportunity to apply for some more grant money to get, hopefully, to give that money to some community organizations to provide this care. I don't want the health department to be in the social services end of it. I want the community to pick that up, and I think they do too. And so we are helping people when they need housing. We're getting them to the right agencies. Um, we can buy food. We, we're giving them thermometers. So, um, but that that's still we still need some help with that. And then in the community impact or the upstream, that of course is our orders, our health orders. And so. The mask order that we have in place right now, um, the uh, um, the the mass gathering order, the numbers that we have, um, what else is in there? The bars and restaurant restrictions, those kind of restrictions, I think, are in that also. We're also helping the schools develop their policies and their plans. They're going to develop them. We're helping them, and we're meeting with them regularly. So that is another area that we are helping the community because of schools. That's going to be um, interesting <laughs> when school starts. Um, so we have a couple of other questions. Um, what, what would be the impact of Medicaid expansion on uh, all of the community clinics that we've talked about today? 
So I would be happy to tackle that one. Um, and I'm glad someone asked that question because I was going to follow up on um, Vicki's question about what can the league do. Um, you know, one of our biggest missions is advocating for our health centers. Um, you know, as I shared earlier, there's $44 million worth of uncompensated care that these clinics are providing. If Medicaid expanded, um, one, we know that more people, 150,000, 250,000 Kansans would have health coverage. That would make them more healthy. It would help them maintain employment easier. Um, you know, it would just have a positive impact overall. The funding that would come to the health centers would in turn help them address staffing needs and programmatic needs so that they could also be helping to address those social determinants of health that many of the patients in our health centers struggle with. So um, I, Medicaid is going to be big on our list, on our platform um, this year. Um, I'm very envious. Missouri is actually voting on passing Medicaid today. Um, and I've had the opportunity to talk to several people um, from that state in the last couple weeks. And so my fingers are crossed for them, you know, because hopefully, you know, Kansas will see that as a good thing and that we're not, we don't want to be that island with, without Medicaid. So. Um, the, um, thank you. The, the other um, question that we have, um, ask that uh, both Alice and Linda speak to um, addressing the issues of funding for the programs um, that are, are currently in place. Um, and I guess, I, you know, I might add a little bit of a context question of my own, which is that I think um, we've, we've always, as a league, we've been concerned about underfunding of public health. Uh, and that COVID really brought that underfunding to the forefront. Um, so um, maybe can you speak a little bit more about uh, the current state of funding and uh, what you hope for the future? You want to go first, Alice, or do you want me to? I, I will defer to you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm, this is the beauty of being at my computer. I'm going to share my screen again. And can you see this slide with the total budget request? Yes. Okay, so this was our 2021 budget request. And I think um, there's some points that are interesting about this. So we have not asked for an increase from our tax allocation from the county in five years. So for five years, we've been the best bargain in the county. So and we continue to do that. You can see a lot of our funding is from grants, which again, there's a lot of administrative work in grants, but we do receive a lot of grants. And then we have some program income for fees we collect for like immunizations and some of the other programs. So you can see that we increased our budget by almost a million dollars because of COVID and that we um, anticipate quite a bit less program income this year because we had stopped those services. So, um, and then I can tell you, we've already spent a million dollars on COVID here at the health department. Um, most of that is coming back from the CARES Act. Um, there's some other funding from KDHE. So now the trick is making sure we weave all those grants in correctly. And luckily we've done a good job of tracking our time um, that we'd spend in COVID. We, we knew how to do, um, incident action plans before we started. We've done incident command before and that really helped us. Really emergency management is keeping us in line. So mm -hmm. that's, that's how the funding looks right now for the health department. Um, I've asked the commissioners not to cut our tax allocation because there's other funding that depends on that. So um, I don't anticipate any problems again this year. Um, so that's the health department. Yeah. I would say for the clinics, the health centers across the state um, and across the country, they have received um, a significant amount of funding from the federal government through the various acts that have been put in place. Um, a lot of those have come with very specific directions. So some of the funding they receive, they specifically have to use for testing purposes. Um, some of the funding they can use for 
capital improvements because so many of them are having to make changes to how um, patients can be seen within their clinic setting to address the potential exposure between individuals. Um, I would say what the biggest challenge is for the clinics though, and while you know, getting the funding is extremely appreciated, it doesn't support the 90% drop in patient visits and that operational loss of funding. And so there have been layoffs. Um, there have been some clinics that have had to close. Um, hopefully that's all temporary. We are starting to see those visits pick up again, but that's probably been the biggest struggle for the clinics is just that operational loss, you know, that helps to support their staff and the services that they provide. So we'll keep moving forward though. So another question is, um, what opportunities do you see moving forward in this time um, for both Shawnee County Health as well as the community clinics? Linda, I, if you don't mind, I'll go first because I'm so excited about this. You know, I talked a little bit about telehealth and telehealth has really transformed um, healthcare in our community and it's transforming how our clinics can provide healthcare in their own communities and across the state. Um, we're working really hard right now to gather data so that we can continue to advocate for all of those policy changes that have happened to stay in place. So even post COVID, post public health emergency, telehealth is still an option for an individual. Um, some of the stories that we're hearing have just been so, I mean, they just, they have brought us to tears in some instances. And one that I love to share is we had a provider who was having a telehealth visit with an individual who was living in their home. And he was doing a Medicare assessment on that individual and asking them a series of questions about fall hazards, tripping hazards, you know, how are they doing in their home? And the person says, everything's great. I don't fall, I never have any issues. And then he sees a dog walk in the background and says, oh, I see you have a dog back there. Oh yeah, I trip over her all the time. So the doctor then says, let's start this assessment again. <laughs> so, you know, telehealth is really giving our healthcare providers an opportunity to see those patients in a totally different setting. And sometimes it's for the benefit of that individual. So. You know, that's one of the things we're working really hard right now on pulling that data in to show, you know, if I have a patient that calls who's canceling their appointment because they don't have transportation, but I can then say, well, hey, let's set you up a telehealth visit in 30 minutes. That's a, pa that's a visit that's been saved and that's a patient that's getting the care that they probably really need. So telehealth has been um, a huge, huge plus in the healthcare field. Um, I think for us, the opportunities, uh, I mean, as I said before, I used to wish more people knew about public health. Now everybody knows about public health and I, I'm <laughs> glad of that because I think now, now that we have your attention <laughs> from, a, from a pandemic, let's see what else we can get done. And the other thing is that when I stand at the podium at commission meetings and I say, I'm not going to talk about COVID, you can see the relief. <laughs> it's like, so I do think we have some opportunities here to get some other things done. And so um, I always like to take my opportunities when I have them. And I do plan to, to um, take advantage of that. So a second epidemiologist we're going to be able to hire. We're showing the importance of data. For our staff, which does affect the community because it's hard to get staff, now we have flexible work hours. We got rid of our dress code. That was one of the most, you know, enjoyable things we did is like, you guys can wear shorts to work now. Nobody's here. And so just to let people relax, work at home, have the equipment they need, the computers. Um, we're able to buy some of the software we hadn't bought before that we can use ongoing. Uh, for our epis it just so there are some there are some real good advantages to this now do i want a pandemic to, to give us these things again no <laughs> let's find another way but um it's it's not all bad news that is the truth so very nice to hear <laughs> um so um 
I, I guess one of my other questions would um, include um, uh, how do you how do you see um, a COVID vaccine rolling out, and what's the future of um, improvements to the Shawnee County numbers? Um, so the vaccine, I'll tackle that one first. Um, you know, I, I'm excited about a vaccine, but you can hear the hesitation in my voice because number one, a vaccine is not going to be perfect. Um, it's not going to make everything go back to the way it was. It's just not anytime soon. Um, there will be a lot of people who, those people that resist masks are probably going to resist vaccines too. I mean, for their own reasons, I'm not judging them, just saying that there are those groups of folks that don't want to do that. Um, and you know, a flu vaccine is only maybe 60% effective and we consider that a good year. So I think you have to kind of think of that too. It's not gonna be 100% effective. You might have to have more than one. Um, now, as far as when we're gonna see it, I think next year at the earliest, um, I don't know if they'll be able to roll out 100 million doses at once. That seems pretty optimistic to me. <laughs> With H1N1, we were given like um, priorities. So H1N1 attacked and it, it affected children the hardest, the worst. They had the worst outcomes. So we did children first and then we did the other groups. We did healthcare workers and then children. So I would guess it's going to happen a lot the same way. Um, KDHE is already getting things set up to distribute vaccine just like they did during H1N1. My comment is bring it on. I know how to do that. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to that. So um, and as far as the numbers in Shawnee County, you know, I, I think we can improve them, but we've got to all get on board with social distancing and wearing masks and not, you know, what we're seeing now is family gatherings are causing outbreaks, um, funerals, weddings. We've got to do things differently. And it's just people are tired and they're emotionally exhausted. And I haven't hugged those twins since January. It's, it's difficult. And we all know it's difficult. But um, we're going to have to get people on board to understand that um, this is what needs to happen. And I'm going to say this. It's not really a political statement, but we need a good message from the feds. We need a strong leadership from the federal level to get people on board. And I'm sorry we haven't had that. And I don't think that's any surprise, but we haven't. And so um, it's tough to do things at the local level when we don't have the national response. So. So do we have other questions? Um, uh, Michael's waving his hand. Can you take yourself off mute, Michael? Maybe. Uh, Linda, uh, can you go back to the graphic you had on the uh, funding for just a second? I closed it. I'll get it back up. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it's, um, it's it's quick. I know where it is. It's me, buried. You can, you can tell me um, if I understood it correctly. It looked as if um, the tax dollars were essentially a million and the rest of your funding was from grants of about three million. Uh, yeah, and like, I, I did I get that anywhere close to yeah, you're pretty close. Um, the tax allocation is actually about 2.1 million. Okay, yeah. We get grants are 4.3. So obviously our grants are our biggest chunk. And then program uh, income. My question is, uh, who's, uh, to whom are those uh, grants being addressed? Who, who are your, um, who are your uh, grant sources there? Okay, um, so it's it's a mix. Um, we get about a, a little over a million dollars for the Women, Infant, and Children program, and that's okay. all staff. I mean, the money for the food they get at the grocery store is a separate pot of money that we don't see. So right. um, that's that's that. Another great big grant is the Maternal and Child Health Grant. That's almost a million, probably eight hundred thousand. Right. Um, that one is for home visitation and prenatal services from our nurses. We also get a big grant from the tobacco settlement and that's the early childhood block grant. That's again for evidence-based home visitation programs in our community. We're just one of several. Um, right. There's some small grants for childcare licensing. Um, 
trying to think what other grants. Um, Chronic disease risk reduction, that's the money that helped fund the Tobacco 21 and all the tobacco right. quit line that you see around town. Um, almost almost all the grants are uh, uh, federal programs that to which you apply. They're all come, those grants all come through KDHE. They're all state grants. So they okay. come from the feds to the state. So actually this CARES Act money is the first federal money we've ever gotten directly in a long time, mm -hmm. since we left the community health center, since they split. Right. Yeah. Alice, you can help me with that if that's. No, that's what I was, that's what I was gonna say is a lot of it's just passed through dollars. Yeah. Through the state. Right. Yep. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you, okay. I appreciate that. Sure. Um, we did have another question um, here about um, what the barriers were to telehealth uh, in the past, uh, before COVID, I might add. Um, Sure. So some of the barriers um, really were related to policies that were in place. Um, there were not opportunities for, um, particularly for federally qualified health centers and rural health clinics to offer telehealth services and get paid for them. So some of those billing numbers got changed. Um, some of that had to come from the federal level and some of that had to come from the state level. The other piece that had to happen is if they were very um, prescriptive on where the service was being provided. So if a provider was in the clinic connecting to a patient via telehealth, it could be paid. But if that provider was now at home and connecting to a patient, that was an unpaid visit. That policy got changed, which was huge, and it took the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare to make that change um, so that was huge. And that's one of those changes that we don't want to see go back on. So those were the biggest, um, probably that was the biggest challenges early on. Um, some of the other challenges, it really just comes down to education and how to access um, a telehealth visit on both ends. You know, the providers themselves and their staff figuring out how to structure telehealth visits effectively. But then also on the consumer side, you know, what do you mean click a link? What do you mean turn my camera on? So all of those types of things that, you know, none of us had really had much experience on. So they're, they're work in progress. Are there any other questions or comments for Alice and Linda? Um, I really want to thank both of you for taking your time and doing this for our league today. Um, very much appreciated. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, so we will uh, see everyone back here um, Tuesday, September the 1st, uh, where we will hear from uh, Chief of Police, Bill Cochran. So um, we'll see you then, and we'll see you at the farmer's market to pick up your yard sign. Uh, thank you. Mondays, 7.30 to 9.30. Thank you. At the library, Farmer's Market. At the library. <laughs> Thank you.